Get ready to enter the Thrive Time Show. We started from the bottom, now we here. We started from the bottom, and we'll show you how to get here. We started from the bottom, now we here. We started from the bottom, now we here. We started from the bottom, now we're on the top. Teaching you the systems to get what we got. Cutting Dixon's on the hooks. I break down the books. Z's bringing some wisdom and the good looks. As the father of five, that's what I'm a dive. So if you see my wife and kids, please tell them hi. It's the C and Z up on your radio. And now three, two, one. Here we go. We started from the bottom, now we here. Jill, the thrill. Thank you for joining me thank here. You, Mr. Clark. Yeah. I, 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 uh, one of my favorite things to do is to get together with you when we have a backdrop of historic barn wood. Mm -hmm. That's I, one of my... This is a lovely backdrop. Yeah. Lovely these, barn. These bulbs scare me from time to time. But uh, we're here to talk about product creation and how to develop a prototype. Um, you have developed this rustic cuff product that so many people all across the, the world love. Uh, celebrities are wearing your products. Uh, you're not paying them. They're wearing them. They're on magazine covers wearing them. I think I saw Britney Spears wears your stuff. It's awesome. Um, so according to Webster, you know, our main man Webster and his rebel, rebel group of dictionary writers, the, the word prototype means an original or first model from something from which other forms are copied or developed. So in the world of product development, you'll hear a lot of people in the industry say, well, you got to make a great prototype. Mm -hmm. You need to make a prototype. And I remember... I don't know, until I was about 22. I didn't know what that word was, really. You know, make a prototype. Make a pro You need a prototype. But in your mind, what is a prototype? You live it. What is a prototype? I never actually knew what a prototype was until I needed to know what a prototype was. Mm. Um, and really, that's the best way to learn something, when you really need to know it. Um, what I've learned is, for me, a prototype is an example or a sample of something that I am creating to see what the ultimate product that I want to release is. Mm, okay. It's the basis of um, it's the basis of a future cuff that may or may not need changes. Um, Lee Cockerell, the guy who used to run Walt Disney World, he has this thing called Be Your Own Shakespeare, mm -hmm. and he literally wrote out almost a story about how the perfect experience to Disney World should be. Mm. And I was amazed. I mean, it's literally a document he's written out. It's like 40 pages long. And he says, well, dad plans the trip. He calls this number. When he calls the number, this person answers the phone. They say this, they feel like this, it goes through this. He shows up at the airport. Someone picks him up in the in the Disney tour bus. They take him to Disney. They And he the whole thing, the check-in process, the bellman says this, this. And he, th then they walk onto the park and it smells like this, it looks like this, the whole thing. And I'm going, you literally have written out. He goes, yeah, I write out the whole story, mm -hmm. and that's my prototype. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going, what? And he said, yeah, I make the whole experience. And I said, well, how do you know if it's perfect? He says, well, it's not. Mm -hmm. You just script it out, and you continue to improve it. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what you're doing, is Absolutely. you're taking your big idea and making a, a rough draft? Absolutely. I have, um, at the beginning of every... Um, well, actually, it's a continual thing throughout the year, but we release a fall collection and a spring collection. And I'm constantly thinking of new ideas, but those new ideas only stay as ideas until I make them into an actual, um, an actual sample. Mm. So uh, I can sketch it out, I can have a picture of what I want, I can ch make changes, but until it's an actual sample, this is what I consider my prototype. So, um, you know, Mike Posner's a songwriter. Mm -hmm. He's him. constantly doing his song sketches. Mm -hmm. You know, he has, his, he has a thing called the notebook mm -hmm. where he writes all of his lyrics in a physical notebook. I want to know in your mind, as a prototype, is that going to be a tangible actual sample product or do you want to have it drawing? Are you looking for like an Etch-a-Sketch, you know, drawing mm -hmm. there? Or what, what is your version of a prototype look like? Because my business is product driven, okay. um, it, it is actually a combination of all of those. So it starts with a thought and then it goes to a drawing and then it goes to actually getting that cuff made so for me the prototype it can't get to this part unless I have the thought and the drawing first but the end end vision is my prototype the actual tangible cuff whether or not it's perfect but that is my prototype. That's the basis of where I start. I'm writing these down here because this is blowing my mind here. So you, you want to make cuffs too, don't you? Well, yeah, I want to be yeah. in the Clay's cuff business. We're <laughs> even more rustic. Okay, no, but you, you have a thought, <laughs> then you have a drawing, mm -hmm. then you have the tangible. Actually, Those yeah. one, two, three. And you can't have, I can't get to the end without having the drawing, for me anyhow, or without having the thought. 
Are you are you uh, kind of a Bob Ross? I mean, do you make these happy trees, and are you making unbelievable drawings? Are you okay with this drawing? Are you pretty I am, rough? I am not. I am not even close to being a Bob Ross. Um, as a matter of fact, I can't even read my own handwriting, so um, it's so bad. So if I make notes, I I don't even know what I said to myself earlier. Uh, so pictures are always so much better, um, but it's very very rough sketches. Very rough. Jill the Thrill, yes. would you be happy to show America and other countries, mm -hmm. non-Americas, uh, would you be happy to draw an example of what one of your sample prototypes might look like? Sure. The drawings? I'm a bad, bad drawer, but I will show you. I just you think this is helpful. Okay, I th I'll show you how the process goes for me. Let's do it. Okay. I'm going to okay. switch chairs so I can watch you. We'll just kind of go over okay. there. Awesome. Okay. Hi. All right, I'm going to move, and I'm going to give you the power pen here okay. and uh, show America how to draw a prototype, okay. my friend. I'm going over here. So if I'm... If I'm at home with my whiteboard or a notepad or if I'm, usually this happens on an airplane. So I'm usually sitting there and I've got three hours of just me and no Wi-Fi. So I've got a notepad and I start thinking of ideas and it, because I'm such a bad drawer, you probably won't even be able to tell this is a cuff, but this is how my brain works. I'm sitting there and I'm looking out the window and I think of my ideas and then I get the notepad out and it goes something like this. It goes like, okay, I think I want it to be about two inches tall. There we go. Okay. I'm thinking it needs a couple lines here, but wait, I wanted one to be here. And then how about a little circle there? But I want this to have sort of a base. And then I want the thickness. Yeah, like that. And then that really looks like an angry face if you put something like that. You wouldn't even know that's a cuff. But for me, because I drew it, I knew the frame. Uh, where my brain was at at the time, I know that this. Do you is label it? You put like Excalibur. No, I don't do actually name it until it? I do. Know? I name all my cuffs and I name them later. But this is enough for me when I go back home to know what that is. No, I don't ever show anybody that so except for your... all the people that just joined Thrive. Well, you'll take your <laughs> thought and you turn it into a thing. Yes. And then you take your thing and make a prototype. Yes, and I make a prototype. So based on this terrible picture, yeah. the, which is it's embarrassing, but I know the idea that I was trying to... Now, if I would never have drawn this out, by the time the plane landed, I may have actually may have gone off my brain. So if I don't get it on paper, it won't happen. I think a lot of people that I... At least a lot of people I've met, entrepreneurs who call me, they say, I have this great idea. And I said, well, have you drawn it? Have you written it down? And they say, well, I don't draw. I, it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Like what you said, it's kind of embarrassing. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really want to show anyone my drawing. I don't even want to show myself my drawing. <laughs> right. Would, I guess, would your encouragement be to that man or woman, just go ahead and draw, even if it's bad, just so that you don't forget the idea? Yeah, because this is so bad, but this actually is good for me. So my drawings, I, I'm, like you said, I'm scared sometimes to look at some of the um, you know, some, let's say I wanted to do a leather cuff and I'm like, okay, I want it to have something I can monogram here and snaps here. Like, I, my husband is a, is a great drawer and when he would draw that, that looks like a dollar bill, okay? Mm. But when he would draw, you would know, you would actually want to take the cuff off of, off of this board and wear it. So I know what that means for me because it was my, it was born from my brain and my heart. So that's all that I need, but no, anybody else, listen, anybody that's watching this has to be a better drawer than I am. There's no way it could be worse than that. Let me ask you a final question yes. while you're at the board here, while you're because this is magic here. Yeah. Do you do make any other drawings before you start making the product? Do you ever maybe say, well, I'm, you ever kind of write even more detailed notes, or I'm just trying to get at your your at your head here of your I process? Do, do you I do, do any so, other drawings? So, for example, let's say I'm on an airplane and I decide, okay, this is the leather cuff I want to do. I want it to have monogrammable piece. Based on that, and especially this helps so I don't forget exactly what that was, I decide, okay, what colors do I want to make that? Okay, then what that, that, that. Okay, um, and then what, uh, what width do I want to do? So I write the notes of the dimensions that I've thought about this cuff to be. So I don't forget about it. So here's my pic my mental picture, and then I just do very, very basic dimensions so I can match those up. Why do I even need to make a prototype if I'm going to try to sell thousands and thousands of products? I mean, why can't I just have my idea and make a bunch of them? Because if you want to sell thousands and thousands and thousands, you have to test it first. I truly believe that you have to have something that uh, you even know if it's going to work or not, and without a prototype, um, you, you, your odds of actually succeeding are, are slim. So again, if you want to sell thousands and mm -hmm. thousands, you have to mm -hmm. test it first. Because it's a matter of, it, it evolves into the, the product that you want it to be. It is very rare that the very first prototype that you made, just based off of your idea or your sketch, is the one. 
There's so much tweaking that goes into it. So if you just launch a product without having a prototype, you, it's, you, then you didn't have the process of the evolving of what it really should have been. How many revisions to that product or a product mm -hmm. would you have before you finally launch it? Well, you might have maybe six or seven or eight. Or how for, many? for mine, mm -hmm. um, sometimes, well, actually, the longer you're in it, the better you get at it. Yeah. and the better the quality is, and so you cut down on your revisions. Mm -hmm. um, initially, when I started to get prototypes and get samples, there were you know four to five different prototypes or revisions to that particular prototype, and even when it launched, it wasn't always perfect. But over time, you learn. But without having tested it in the first place, it would have epically failed. I know a lady who um, wanted to get into the bakery business, mm -hmm. and she started making these really nice cakes, and she, people said, you make great cakes, you should be going to start a cake company. So she makes some cakes. I said, you, the cakes were so good, you should make another. And I remember she made a wedding cake for somebody on the big stage, this big thing. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, who made that cake? Because it looked so terrible. It kind of it yeah, was leaning yeah. in the wedding. And that was the first time that she'd ever had to test something new. Mm -hmm. and, but she tested it in front of a lot of people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so when it failed, she got her emotions hurt. Mm -hmm. And she basically dropped out of that mm -hmm, business. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to encourage her. I'm like, hey, we need to fail, but just not in front of everybody. Exactly. I mean, we just need to fail in, in like the living room and, yeah. and build a... So I guess what you're saying is if I have a prototype, there are three steps. We take the thought, mm -hmm. we make a drawing, mm -hmm. then we make it tangible, but we need to probably just keep testing it until it's perfect. Absolutely. And and really, it, it, the, the chances of that first prototype that just came from my thought onto paper being the perfect one that I launch and then sell thousands, yeah. it, it doesn't happen that way. Mm. Because ultimately, some something was a little sharp here, or it, the fit wasn't comfortable, and you... you Really, it takes about three, four, five, six, sometimes more, to get it to the perfect product or, you know, perfect is, I, I hate saying the word perfect, but to get it to the product that you want, that you feel comfortable releasing, that you know is going to do very well. One of the things that I find myself doing, and a lot of, I hear a lot of entrepreneurs do this, is we're working on a prototype, mm -hmm. and we are pumped. Oh, yeah. I remember when I <laughs> came with my first, first products with the wedding entertainment business, I thought, oh, man, this is, is Eureka, and I would pull <laughs> this all-nighter, and then the next morning, I'm like, that is terrible. Mm -hmm. And I would do it again and again. Mm -hmm. I just want to know, I mean, how many all-nighters and, and how much coffee, you know, were you drinking when you first launched Rustic Cuff mm -hmm. to get those first couple prototypes right? I mean, were you pulling all-nighter yeah. after all-nighter? I, after... I, I tell this that for the first year, once a week, I missed a night of sleep. Oh. Once a week. And, and, and I'm not, that is no lie. And then probably the other four nights... Uh, four of the nights were maybe three to four hours of sleep. How long did it take you? How many, how many hours or how many days? I guess the question is, how many days did it take you before you developed one prototype that actually was a product that could sell? Okay, probably the first cuff that I made that I felt like I could put out there, it was for me two months. Two so months? I, two months. And we're talking. That's I knew nothing. You're putting the kids to big bed at 9:30 at night. Yeah. You're staying up from like uh -huh. 10 o'clock at yeah. night till what four in the morning? Yeah. Six days a week? Yeah, six. Well, five days a week. One, I'd sleep in one day. Five days a week. Uh -huh. So we're talking five times six, like 30 hours a week mm -hmm. for two months. Mm -hmm. Missed one whole night. Then the other nights, so I'd get like three or four hours of sleep. And working on it that much. Now I know not every product is going to take that much. Yeah. But this because I didn't. I wanted to make something that was like I said better than was already being made. And with, without having spent that amount of time, I don't think it was gonna get there. What'd you pay yourself for those 240 hours? That is so crazy. I never paid myself a dime. Never even thought about paying, because I just got the satisfaction. And my husband, um, one night we were laying in bed. Well, actually, no, I didn't go to sleep with him for about a year. He just said, are you ever gonna come sleep with me again? Really? Yeah, and I said, someday. So I'm, start, <laughs> I'm thinking about next week starting that. He's like, just get again. the prototype right. Yeah, so he said, <clears throat> I don't understand how you can spend so much time on something and you are not getting paid. And I said, well, this at first was never about me getting paid. It was just the passion of doing it. And he said, well, we, you know, you got at least your time is so valuable and you're losing so much sleep. So that's a whole other chapter. So I just want to encourage anybody, any entrepreneur watching this, because as we interview you, Jill, and a lot of other mm -hmm. um, successful entrepreneurs, we're finding more and more that hundreds and hundreds of hours are being spent mm -hmm. on something that's not even good mm -hmm. until the first sign of success. Yeah, yeah. So if you're watching this and you're digging for gold, and don't stop, because you might just be three feet from gold. Absolutely. I mean, you might be yeah. three inches from gold. Yeah. You just have to keep going. Yeah. And, and the more you get into it, the more of a shame it would be to stop because you have invested 
so much time into it. There is a person, and I'm going to just be general, gen, gender neutral so I don't get myself in trouble for sharing too much of the story. But there's a person I know who has spent a ton of money on developing their product. Mm -hmm. And they've hired an engineer. They've hired a lawyer. They've got a patent. Mm -hmm. They now have a patent attorney who says there is a potentially another patent we need to file. And so we're probably $80,000 mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. Not a single one has sold, mm -hmm. nor does anybody know about said product except for said person. Mm -hmm. Would you advise that anybody watching this should go out and hire an engineer, a lawyer, an attorney, and all that to build a prototype? Or do we just need to get in the garage and get a little crazy with some... What, what is, do you recommend we hire all these professionals? I think I know that same person. Okay. Um, you know what I... What I would recommend is the person who is going to go out and hire the lawyer, um, the engineer, invest the eighty thousand. Let that person should be somebody that already has done five, six, seven other products mm. successfully mm. and ha has the confidence that knows that this is going to work. That for you know it, it all depends. I mean that's a lot of money. For, this, and to be all, just be transparent, I want to give this example yeah. some context sure. here. This is a person who uh, you know makes probably a, a teacher's salary. Yeah. And has yeah. just taken every dime for the next maybe four or five years of income yeah. plus all their life savings to do this. The, I, I truly believe there are other ways to do it than to take that amount of money and time um, and invest in something that you're not even sure. I really, really believe there are other ways. Now, let me ask you this. What kind of people do you not need to hire and what kind of people do you need to hire to make your prototype? I mean, do you, do you need to go out there and get an attorney? Do you need to get a, a, a lawyer? I mean, is there anybody you say that you go, I, you definitely need at least an engineer to help you? Or you need a, you, I mean, anybody you need to hire? Or you can know, it just be your friends? I think what? it depends on the product. Okay. Uh, if it's something that you feel is patentable and you need to get a patent on it ASAP, yeah. then yeah, I would hire an attorney. That okay. is something I would invest in. Um, you know, as far as an engineer and the other people, I, there's, a, there's so much that you can do to get a prototype without having to go mm. and spend, I mean, you can spend very little money on a sample. It, yeah. does, not it does not take that much um, cash to get a sample of, for your prototype, but people don't even understand that. And they think it's gonna take so much investment in different people hiring and going you know, overseas, which I know we're not gonna talk about that right now, but it, it doesn't, it really is, is not that difficult. Of a it creates like a, a barrier project. of entry where people yes. feel like, oh my gosh, I have to spend all this money. No, it's not like that. Okay. Yeah, especially, I mean, on, for mine, you know, mine is such a diff there are some products that are technical and they, you know, to get a prototype of that would require so much more of an investment, but there's still much easier ways to do it. There is an adult I know <clears throat> who has made uh, gross sales over a hundred million dollars of products. And he pulled me aside one time and I said, what's your theory on patents? And he said, well, what I do is I go through all the work of getting a patent. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I make a great product, mm -hmm. overseas, there's a couple countries, in particular this was the uh, great uh, country of China, mm -hmm. they would rip off his product mm -hmm. within days mm -hmm. of getting it mm -hmm. and be selling them. Absolutely. And he said, and good luck suing those people. Yeah. So I said, so what's your theory? And he says... I honestly, I go to market first and mm -hmm. see if there's a need for it. And if there is, then I go for the patent. Yeah. But I don't even go for it until I know if someone wants to buy it. Absolutely. And yeah. I said, really? And he said, yeah. And this is a guy who sold $100 million of products. Yeah. And, and I, I met another one of his friends and he said the similar thing. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. 100%. I think there are, <clears throat> there are easy ways to tell if people are going to like your product without having to invest the amount of money in a patent. And I mean, and like you said, Good luck having a patent hold up in another country, and um, yeah, yeah. I just I don't think I don't think people understand that though, and that's very scary. It's the lack of knowledge on that that would scare people away. I I just want to encourage you if you have a product idea right now and you feel like it's going to cost you a hundred thousand dollars of legal fees mm -hmm. and all these uh, professionals and engineers to to make a prototype, don't let that stand in the way. Mm -hmm. Just get in the garage, get mm -hmm. some crazy glue, get mm -hmm. started. Absolutely. I mean, um, now the, the the Steve Jobs, you know, mm -hmm. he's the co-founder of, of Apple. Uh, he's the man who grew Pixar into this filmmaking juggernaut that it is today. He says, sure. What we do has to make commercial sense, but it's never the starting point. Mm -hmm. We start with the product <clears throat> and the user experience. Mm -hmm. What does that quote mean to you? I mean, because you're a big from the gut person. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? It means that, you know, I can draw out a plan and I can figure out how it's going to work in wholesale and retail. But really, if, it's, if it is not going to work with the 
person I want to sell it to, then why would I even have, why would I even continue on with that? So I would say for anybody that has a big idea, there are such simple ways to even test it out to see if it's going to be marketable. I know somebody who started a food company and the food was so rough. Yeah. But they, they brought it by in the packaging, and yeah. it was super nice yeah. packaging. We're talking maybe 20 Gs in the packaging yeah. and everything. Yeah. And they were like, we're in stealth mode. <laughs> I'm in stealth mode. They would actually use this word. I'm in stealth mode. I, I, I'm, mum is my word. Mum. And I'm like, well, can I have some of the mum? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, sure. Well, yeah. And it was truly awful. Uh-huh. And they never had gone outside of the building. Yeah. Do you recommend going outside of the building to get some feedback yeah, once absolutely. you have something? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, when I first started and only a few people saw them, when I had a party, there were 100 people there who had not really seen them before. And the feedback that you'll get from 100 people is worth more than any dollar that you can spend Mm. because that's free. That is free. You have 100 people come to a party looking at your cups. You see what they're going to buy. You see what they don't like, what they leave alone, what they're attracted to, and you cannot pay for that. that. That is so really... For anybody, I'm not saying you need to throw a party and have your have your prototype there. We need but to throw, anyone needs to throw a rustic cuff party. Exactly. Okay, that that's a great point. But I think that it does not hurt to have people come and see if it's even marketable or see if it's even something that would sell without having to invest. You know, fifty thousand, eighty thousand. Now, did, did did you have anyone working for you as you were making the prototype? Was it you and like a a dude or a lady friend or was anybody helping you? It was me. You? It was just me for a year. Mm -hmm. A year? A year. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It was a hard, hard year. But that's because I um, I'd never thought that I needed an employee Mm. because I was so into it that I just wanted to be my thing. I didn't... At what point did you hire your first person to help you either develop the product or at least just, you know, get the product going? I mean, did you... What point did you hire somebody? You know, the, the point that I hired my first person was a year after I started and it was when I realized I could not handle the emails that were coming in. Mm because that was a full-time job. And so I needed to do what I did best, and that was design and then create and make. And I could not handle, the, the which was a full-time job, the constant communication every day of um, all the people that were now starting to buy them. I loved that part, but I just couldn't do both. I have a confession. This Tell is me. pretty funny. With the DJ company, I was so worried about hiring people. Because I'd answer the phone, I'd say, Thank you for calling DJ Connection. This is your ultra humble host, DJ Clay. How can I help you? And they're like, am I on the radio? And, they just right. would, and I had a certain way I would yeah. do it. And I thought yeah. no one could ever learn this because so I'm the only person ever. I thought so and too. so I literally, when I hired people, I, I, and this is embarrassing, but I did this up <laughs> until 2003. So we're doing almost 1,000 weddings a, a year at this point. And I had one phone, and yeah. I called it the money phone. And I had a dollar sign I drew on with Sharpie. <laughs> And if the phone rang, I was like, phone! And everyone would run to the phone and bring me the phone. And then if it was a not a sales call, I could pass off. It was like an advertiser or somebody. But if it was a sales call, yeah. I would do it. Yeah. And I just never, I never wanted to hire somebody. Because yeah. I thought, well, no one could do it like well, me. Nobody... And then I got to that email mode mm-hmm. in the call mode where I couldn't possibly. Uh-huh. And so that's when I delegated too. So you... And nobody, in my mind, nobody could make it like I could. Because I only... Had made, I was the only one who had ever made it. So the product you're getting needed to be made by me. That was my big thing. And, but when I started getting hundreds of orders at a time, so the reason that I hired, <laughs> when I hired my first girl, we, got, um, we were on Good Morning America, and I think we sold like 2,000 in the first day. And I knew then that I was in big trouble. Um, and so I had to give up some of the, okay, I cannot do this all by myself. Um, and that's when I had my first girl. So if I'm watching this and I am struggling to decide whether to hire my first person to come help turn mm-hmm. my big idea into this big time product, mm-hmm. how should I decide whether it's time to hire someone or not? It really, I think that you will, you'll know because when you can't do it by yourself anymore, when your quality is slipping in, on, in any area um, because there's only one of you, then I think it's time to at least try, even if it's just part-time. Have somebody relieve you of something so you can do what you do really well. Because when you have to start spreading yourself too thin, then you're not really doing what you do well. I think it's important, too, that I, just two rules that I've used in my career. I don't know if you agree. I want to get your okay. feedback. Is I always try to staff my weakness. Yeah. Whatever I feel yeah. like I'm weakest at, maybe it's the quality slipping yeah. or... or that and then I always try to only hire when I need to. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as like I try to keep a Spartan in a startup, mm-hmm. keep it very like a Spartan workforce yeah. of, where you have very few people. It's lean. 
And yeah. you only hire when you, you need to? Absolutely. Do you agree with that or am Ab I off? hundred percent agree. I don't want to have somebody standing around going, okay, now what, what, what's your job? So I, I would almost rather wait until we were desperate and then fill that need. Like all of us work until we can't handle it anymore and then fill that need. Last week we had a guy named Dan. He said, I'm scheduled 18 of the next 24 hours every day this week. Mm -hmm. Can we hire somebody? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, we probably should. <laughs> But I'm so into it, yeah. I don't even notice. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> because I'm passionate. Exactly. <clears throat> because I'm passionate, I don't even notice, yeah. really. And uh, I think as an entrepreneur, we just have to make sure we keep it lean, yeah. staff our weakness. Um, now, if, if, I'm, if I'm watching this and I feel like that I've developed this prototype, and I, and I, and I feel like that I know there's a market for it, mm -hmm. um, d did you immediately, I mean, d start marketing it? Or do you recommend that if I'm an entrepreneur and I have my prototype done now, Okay. Do I immediately start marketing it, or do I try to go out and fi find a factory to mass produce this? I mean, what is the, the next step? I have my prototype. Mm -hmm. I think people want it. Mm -hmm. Do I rush to market? Do I find a factory? Mm -hmm. What do I do? You know, one of the greatest ways that you can really test it, I would, uh, this, is my, this is my opinion, but I would not go to a factory to get it mass made right then. Because you, um, you really, there are great ways that you can test it. One of the great ways is you can go to market and set up a booth and you can get a lot of feedback from a lot of different locations and um, different personalities and that will be one of the big telling things. So go to market. When you say market, is this a, is this a physical place? What is, when you say go to market, uh, what is market? How do I find a market? Walk me through what you say when you say market. What is that? Okay, so it depends on what product that you're. Can I pick uh, one? Just for pick a, second? a product. Let's say that I am making uh, jeans, a new okay. kind of jeans. Okay, so you would go to an apparel market, and it could be apparel and accessories, but there are many different types. Um, some more popular than others around the country: Vegas, New York, Dallas, Atlanta, um, several times a year, and you would pick. Uh, you would pick one of those, and then you would go set up a booth. Um, you'd pay the fee for How a booth. How much does it cost to be in a market? You know, it can range anywhere. If for the ones that I just told you, it can range anywhere from two thousand to I think, uh, you know, at least ten thousand. Two thousand to ten thousand. That's just to a go range. To, I mean, just yeah. a bit, I mean, if you're going on, I mean, I just want people to understand. If you yeah. go online and you find a market and they're asking for ten thousand or four thousand, yeah. don't yeah. be freaked. That that's that's no. normal. Depending on you know, depending on the booth size and depending on all the goodies that you want with the booth, I think we paid ten thousand dollars for when we went to Vegas market last year. And you had to design your own booth on top of that. Yes, we had to design our own booth, yeah. And then, of course, you have all the expenses of going out to the... What does a booth cost to design? Um, we did it ourselves, and believe it or not, we went and bought um, from Ikea, like, because it was cheaper to do it this way, and, and got, like, six different sets of shelves and then just put it together um, at market. We did it. We did it right there. We just kept it very simple, so it doesn't have to be... And they yeah. have stuff... They have stuff there that you can use, but... It's a great way. We had never done market before. It's a great way because you have hundreds and hundreds of retail stores that are coming through all different kinds, from high end to um, you know very to small boutiques, and they're all walking through and they're seeing. Uh, it depends on the market, but there's you know hundreds and uh, 300, 500 booths in one big space, wow. and they walk through and they decide they have X amount of budget and they decide what they want to. So the buyers for the stores, for the stores. are there, mm -hmm. and they're walking around going, I want to see if I want to buy this yeah. product or that product and put it in my... Let's see what's new, let's see what's fresh, and let's see what, you know, some of our uh, some of our suppliers that we've purchased before, let's go, a lot of them go back for that purpose, to rebuy for the coming season. Do they ask you for any information? Do they expect every retail, or every vendor there to have a certain yeah. thing? Yeah, yeah, we need to see a line sheet. Um, and this was all new to us because we'd never done anything like this before. I'm gonna just harass you here. When Absolutely. you say, we wanna see a line sheet, what's line a line sheet? Line sheet or what your retail prices, what your wholesale prices are, what they would be for that store. So it's basically a list of everything that you sell and then what the wholesale prices would be if I were to sell to this store. But they'll just say, do you have a line sheet? Yeah, they'll say, do you have a line sheet? And you don't know what that word means no. unless you're watching some thriving. Yeah, what's your MOQ, what's your minimum order requirement? Which I mean, there, there's a lot of the, the language that you don't know or that you don't even know that you'll need until you get in there if, if you're brand new at this. Can you give me a few other things that they would ask you for that they believe to be common sense? Like, what, is, what else do they say? An MLQ? MOQ, your MLQ. minimum order requirement. Minimum order requirement. Mm -hmm. And they expect you to know this. Yeah, minimum order quantity, sorry. 
Um, they expect, yeah, you, and this is in anything, in any type of ordering or prototype, all this stuff, there is a basic language that you really just learn when you get into it. And it's not, it's not that difficult. But okay. you'll have these stores that have been going to market for 10, 15, 20 years, longer, and that, that's all that they know. And this is your first time, and it's very scary. But what you realize is that they don't know that. They mm. don't know that you don't know all this. Mm. And so it's very, it's very scary to think that you're that vulnerable because everybody's going to see this our first time. But I wanted to see how we were going to be received to the entire country. So we set up a booth. How long is this market? Three days. Three this days. This one was three days. What time does it start every day? Uh, it starts at about 10 o'clock, every, 9 or 10 o'clock every day. And it ends about 5 or 6. So you're on your feet for 8 or 9 all, hours? Yeah, all day. Three and, days. And not only that, but you have to be on. On? On. What does that mean? Uh, Personality-wise, you have to, you, you, there's no, there's no just chilling. Cause you always, you don't know at any, any point who's, who's going to be walking by. And so you're always on. You're, and I want to. Well, you're get, always on. So that, that probably didn't even make sense to you. Well, I, I, I want to share this because I want to make sure we, I mean, I wake up, uh, my wife makes fun of me with this, but I wake up, I have this kind of process I do. I don't yeah. give too much information, but I wake up and I like about two hours by myself in my bathtub every morning okay. and I read my stuff. And if I, anyone speaks to me, I kind of mumble. I'm like Shaquille O'Neal when he's tired. <laughs> and I, 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 I don't really articulate myself too well. But if I get in front of people, I sort of right. articulate myself. Yeah. Yeah. I see a lot of people at market. Mm -hmm. I've been to those markets. Mm -hmm. And they're not on. Yeah, they're not You've on. seen them. They're sitting down. And that makes all the difference. And they're not even on. No. And they're trying to sell their own product. They're eating. They're eating. They're eating their lunch and their cardboard thing. And the, yeah, that, I see that all the time. And because they're so exhausted or because they just, they don't care as much. But you have to have people there, whether it be you with whomever you're with, but they have to be on because that's ha half the sale. So if you have your prototype done, you don't want to just park it. You want to go to market. You want to go to market. You want to test it. But, but the, and then I know I have some friends, I have some good friends who had the same thing. They didn't have like 50 different cups. They had a product. And so they went to market, they set up a booth, and they had basically, because when you come up with a prototype, it's not always 20 different styles of that. Sometimes it's just one thing that you want to market. Mm. And so they took that one thing, and they did an amazing booth, and then they had 50 basically of the same thing. Mm. So people would walk by, and they got great feedback, and they realized this can really work, because we have 50 stores that want to sign us up, and we're not even prepared yet to do that. So for them, it was more of a testing, but it worked. And they got to see from a wide variety of people whether or not it's even worth investing further. I want to make sure that you're hearing this if you're <laughs> watching this because typical education, what you want to do is you want to um, study mm -hmm. and then you don't take the history exam until you feel confident mm -hmm. you're going to get an A. So you study and you study and you want to get an A when you... Mm -hmm. But in entrepreneurship, you have an idea and then you go out and you actually test it to see if someone wants to buy it yeah. before you decide if you're going to invest all the money yeah. into... Yeah. Doing, I know for Thrive, we uh, uh, interviewed thousands, literally thousands of college students, entrepreneurs, business owners, and saying, do you have a need for, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of people, yes, uh, yes. But I mean, we had to hear that before we knew whether sure. it was worth spending money on. Sure. So this is, this is good stuff. Now, I want to ask you this. I know a lot of very smart people who are super scared about taking that leap of faith and turning their idea mm -hmm. into reality, turning it into the prototype here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Napoleon Hill, my favorite success author, he says, the time will never be just right. Mm -hmm. We must act now. <laughs> so in closing, if I'm watching this and I've been struggling for years or months to turn my big idea into an actual product mm -hmm. in prototype, I mean mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. I've been sitting on the idea and it's been years. To, what encouragement would you have for me if I've been sitting on the sidelines, haven't jumped into the entrepreneurship game because mm -hmm. I'm scared, mm -hmm. what encouragement would you say to me? One of the things I think that people wait so long is because they think it's not perfected and I'm not going to get out there until it's all perfect right here. And one of my favorite sayings is done is better than perfect. Mm. So, and I love that uh, because you, it may never be perfect, but you can perfect it as you go. So to say, I, what I would say to that person is get off of the sidelines, um, get it in front of people who would be your potential market See if it's something that you can launch, even if it's not at the perfected final stage, because that can come in time. I, I, I just, I hope if you're watching this, you're hearing what Jill's saying here, because I, I've met some incredible people. I met one lady who's an author who never wrote a book, because it's just little old me, it's just mm -hmm. little books mm -hmm. I write for my kids. I just write these books for my grandkids. I'm like, you write books for your grandkids. Well, she <laughs> releases her first book. It's a bestseller. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. And she'd been sitting on it for like 15 years. Yeah. And now she's like, I don't know why I didn't do that mm -hmm. all that time. Mm -hmm. So I would just encourage you. What you said is awesome. Done is better than perfect. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. Jill, I appreciate you letting me harass you. Thank you you are an angel of truth and a great American. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate Greg. it. JT, do you know what time it is? Um, 410. It's <laughs> it's Tebow time in Tulsa, oh. Jerusalem, baby. Tim Tebow is coming to Tulsa, Oklahoma, June 27th and 28th. We've been doing business conferences here uh, since 2005. I've been hosting business conferences since, since 2005. What year were you born? Uh, 1995. Dude, I've been hosting business conferences since you were 10 years old, but I've never had to the two-time Heisman Award winning Tim Tebow come present. And a lot of people, you know, have followed Tim Tebow's football career on the field. Uh, and off the field and off the field, the guy's been just as successful as he has been on the field. Now, the big question is, JT, how does he do it? Mm, well, they're going to have to come and find out because I don't know. Well, I'm just <laughs> saying, Tip Tebow is going to teach us how he organizes his day, how he organizes his life, how he's proactive with his faith, his family, his finances. He's going to walk us through his mindset that he brings into the gym, into business. It is going to be a blasty blast in Tulsa, Jerusalem. Also, this is the first uh, Thrive Time show event that we've had where we're going to have a man who has built a hundred million dollar net worth. Wow. Who'll be presenting. Now, we've had a couple presenters that um, have had a billion dollar net worth mm. um, in some like real estate sort of things. Yeah. But this is the first time we We've had a guy who's built a service business and he's built over a hundred million dollar net worth in the service business. It's the yacht driving, uh, multi-state living guru of franchising. Peter Taunton will be in the house. This is the founder of Snap Fitness, the guy behind Nine Round Boxing. He's going to be here in Tulsa, Jerusalem, Tulsa, Jerusalem, Oklahoma, June 27th and 28th. JT, why should everybody want to hear what Peter Totten has to say? Oh, because he's incredible. He's just a fountain of knowledge. He is awesome. He has uh, inspired me listening to him talk. And not only that, he also has, uh, he practices what he teaches. So he's a real teacher. He's not a fake teacher like business school teachers. So you got to come learn from him. Also, let me tell you this, folks. I don't want to get this wrong because if I get it wrong, um, someone's going to say, you screwed that up, buddy. So Michael <laughs> Levine, this is Michael Levine. He's going to be coming. You say, Who, who's Michael Levine? I don't want to get this wrong. This is the P PR consultant of choice for Michael Jackson, wow. for Prince, wow. for Nike, for mm. Charlton Heston, for Nancy mm. Kerrigan, 34 Grammy Award winners, 43 New York Times bestselling authors he's represented, including pretty much everybody you know who's been a super celebrity. This is Michael Levine, a good friend of mine. He's going to come and talk to you about personal branding and the mindset needed to be super successful. The lineup will continue to grow. We have hit Christian recording artist Colton Dixon in the house. Now, people say, Colton Dixon's in the house? Yes, Colton Dixon's in the house. So if you like top 40 Christian music, Colton Dixon's going to be in the house performing. The lineup will continue to grow each and every day. We're going to add more and more speakers to this all-star lineup. But I encourage everybody out there today, get those tickets today. Go to thrivetimeshow.com. Again, that's thrivetimeshow.com. And some people might be saying, well, how do I do it? What do I do? How does it work? You just go to thrivetimeshow.com. Let's go there now. We're feeling the flow. We're going to thrivetimeshow.com. Thrivetimeshow.com. Again, you just go to thrivetimeshow.com. You click on the business conferences button and you click on the request tickets button right there. Uh, the way I do our conferences is we tell people it's $250 to get a ticket yep, or whatever price that you can afford. And the reason why I do that is I grew up without money. Uh, JT, you're in the process of building a super successful company. Um, yep. Did you start out with a million dollars in the bank account? No, I did not. Nope. Did not get any loans, nothing like that. Did not get an inheritance from parents or anything like that. I had to work for it. And I uh, am super grateful. I came to a business conference. That's actually how I met you, met Peter Totten. I met all these people. So if you're out there today and you want to come to our workshop again, you just got to go to thrivetimeshow.com. You might say, well, when's it going to be? June 27th and 28th. And you might say, well, who's speaking? We already covered that. You might say, where's it going to be? It's going to be in Tulsa, Jerusalem, Oklahoma. So it says Tulsa, Jerusalem. Uh, it's I'm really trying to rebrand Tulsa as Tulsa, Jerusalem, sort of like the Jerusalem of America. But if you go to, if you type in Thrive Time Show and Jinx, you can get a sneak peek or a look at our office facility. This is what it looks like. This is where you're headed. It's going to be a blasty blast. You can look inside, see the facility. We're going to have hundreds of entrepreneurs here. It is going to be packed. Now, for this particular event, folks, uh, the seating is always limited because my facility isn't a limitless um convention center you're coming to my actual home office and so it's going to be packed so when june 27th and 28th who you you're going to come who you I, I, i'm talking to you you can just get your tickets right now at thrivetimeshow.com and again 
You can name your price. We tell people it's $250 or whatever price you can afford. And we do have some select VIP tickets, which gives you an access to meet some of the speakers and those sorts of things. And those tickets are $500. It's a two-day interactive business workshop, over 20 hours of business training. We're going to give you a copy of my newest book, The Millionaire's Guide to Becoming Sustainably Rich. You're going to leave with a workbook. You're going to leave with everything you need to know to start and grow a super successful company. It's practical, it's actionable, and it's Tebow time right here in Tulsa, Jerusalem. Get those tickets today at thrivetimeshow.com. Again, that's thrivetimeshow.com. Hello, I'm Michael Levine, and I'm talking to you right now from the center of Hollywood, California, where I have represented over the last 35 years 58 Academy Award winners, 34 Grammy Award winners, 43 New York Times bestsellers. I've represented a lot of major stars, and I've worked with a lot of major companies and I think I've learned a few things about what makes them work and what makes them not work. Now, why would a man living in Hollywood, California in the beautiful sunny weather of LA come to Tulsa? Because last year I did it and it was damn exciting. Clay Clark has put together an exceptional uh, presentation, really life-changing and I'm looking forward to seeing you then. I'm Michael Levine. I'll see you in Tulsa. James, did I tell you my good friend John Lee Dumas is also joining us at the in-person two-day interactive Thrive Time Show Business Workshop? That Tim Tebow and that uh, Michael Levine will be at. Have I told you this? You have not told me that. Oh, he's coming all the way from Puerto Rico. This is John Lee Dumas, the host of the chart-topping EOFire.com podcast. He's absolutely a living legend. This guy started a podcast after uh, uh, wrapping up his service in the United States military. And he started recording this podcast daily in his home to the point where he started interviewing big time folks like Gary Vaynerchuk, like Tony Robbins. And he just kept interviewing bigger and bigger names, putting out shows day after day. And now he is the legendary host of the EO Fire podcast. And he's traveling all the way from Puerto Rico to Tulsa, Oklahoma to attend the in-person June 27th and 28th Thrive Time Show two-day interactive business workshop if you're out there today folks you've ever wanted to grow a podcast a broadcast you want to get in you want to improve your marketing if you've ever wanted to improve your marketing your branding if you've ever wanted to increase your sales you want to come to the two-day interactive june 27th and 28th thrive time show business workshop featuring tim tebow michael levine john lee dumas and countless big time super successful entrepreneurs it's going to be life-changing get your tickets right now at thrivetimeshow.com james what website is that thrivetimeshow.com james one more time before enthusiasm thrivetimeshow.com Everything rides on tonight Even if I got three strikes I'ma go for it This moment we own it eh? I'm not to be played with Because it could get dangerous See these people I ride with This moment we own it Thrive Time Show two-day interactive business workshops are the world's highest rated and most reviewed business workshops because we teach you what you need to know to grow. You can learn the proven 13-point uh, business systems that Dr. Zellner and I have used over and over to start and grow successful companies. I mean, we get into the specifics, the specific steps on what you need to do to optimize your website. We're going to teach you how to fix your conversion rate. Uh, we're going to teach you how to do a social media marketing campaign that works. How do you raise capital? How do you get a small business loan? We teach you everything you need to know here during a two-day, 15-hour workshop. It's all here for you. You work every day in your business, but for two days you can escape and work on your business and build these proven systems so now you can have a successful company that will produce both the time freedom and the financial freedom that you deserve. You're going to leave energized, motivated, but you're also going to leave empowered. The reason why I've built these workshops is because as an entrepreneur, I always wish that I had this. And because there wasn't anything like this, I would go to these motivational seminars, no money down, real estate, Ponzi scheme, get motivated seminars, and they would never teach me anything. It was like you went there and you paid for the, the big chocolate Easter bunny, but inside of it, it was a hollow nothingness. And I wanted the knowledge, and they're like, oh, but we'll teach you the knowledge after our next workshop. 
And the great thing is we, we have nothing to upsell. At every workshop, we teach you what you need to know. There's no one in the back of the room trying to sell you some next big uh, get rich quick, walk on hot coals uh, product. It's literally, we teach you the brass tacks, the specific stuff that you need to know to learn how to start and grow a business. But I encourage you to not believe what I'm saying, and I want you to Google uh, the Z66 auto auction. I want you to Google elephant in the room. Look at Robert Zellner and Associates. Look them up and say, are they successful because they're geniuses or are they successful because they have a proven system? When you do that research, you will discover that the same systems that we use in our own business can be used in your business. Come to Tulsa, book a ticket, and I guarantee you it's going to be the best business workshop ever. And we'll even give you your money back if you don't love it. We've built this facility for you, and we're excited to see you. Now you may be thinking, what does it actually cost to attend an in-person two-day interactive Thrive Time Show business workshop? Well, good news. The tickets are $250 or whatever price that you can afford. What? Yes, they're $250 or whatever price you can afford. I grew up without money, and I know what it's like to live without money. So if you're out there today and you want to attend our in-person two-day interactive business workshop, all you got to do is go to thrivetimeshow.com to request those tickets. And if you can't afford $250, we have scholarship pricing available to make it affordable for you. I learned at the Academy in King's Point in New York, octa non verba. Watch what a person does, not what they say. Whoa. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Harvard Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. Today I'm broadcasting from Phoenix, Arizona, not Scottsdale, Arizona. They're closed, but they're completely different worlds. And uh, we have a special guest today. Uh, definition of intelligence is if you agree with me, you're intelligent. And so this gentleman is very intelligent. I've done this show before also, but very seldom do you find somebody who lines up on all counts. And so Mr. Clay Clark, he's a friend of a good friend, Eric, Eric Trump. But we're also talking about money, bricks, and how screwed up the world can get in a few and a half hour. So Clay Clark is a very intelligent man. And there's so many ways we could take this thing but I thought, uh, since you and Eric are close, Trump, what were you saying about what Trump can't, what Donald, who is my yeah. age, and I can say or cannot say? What, well, I have to, first of all, I have to honor you, sir. I want to show you what I did to one of your books here. There's all a right. guy by the name of Jeremy Thorne, who was my boss at the time. I was 19 years old, working at Faith Highway. I had a job at Applebee's, Target, and DirecTV. And he said, have you read this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? And I said, no. And uh, my father, may he rest in peace, um, he didn't know these financial principles. So I started reading all of your books and uh, really devouring your books. And I went okay. from being an employee to self-employed to the business owner to the investor. And I owe a lot of that to you. And I just want to take a moment to tell you thank you so much for allowing me to, to, to achieve success. And then I'll tell you all about Eric Trump. But I just want to tell you, thank you, sir, for changing my life. Well, not only that, Clay, you know, thank you, but you've become an influencer. You know, more than anything else, you've evolved into an influencer where your word has more and more power. So that's why I uh, congratulate you on becoming. Because as you know, there's a lot of fake influencers out there, too, or bad influencers. Yeah. But anyway, I'm, well, I'm, I'm glad you and I agree so much. And thanks for reading my books. Yeah. That's, that's the greatest thrill for me today. Not thrill, but recognition is when people, young men especially, come up and say, I read your book, changed my life. I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. I learned at the Academy in Kings Point in New York, octa non verba. Watch what a person does, not what they say. Whoa. Hey, I'm Ryan Wimpy. I'm originally from Tulsa, born and raised here. I went to a small private liberal arts college and got a degree in business. And I didn't learn anything like they're teaching here. I didn't learn linear workflows. I learned stuff that I'm not using and I haven't been using for the last nine years. So what they're teaching here is actually way better than what I got at business school. And I went what was actually ranked as a very good business school. The linear workflow, the linear workflow for us and getting everything out on paper and documented is really important. Um, like we have workflows that are kind of all over the place to so the Having linear workflow and seeing that mapped out on multiple different boards uh, is pretty awesome. That's really helpful for me. The atmosphere here is awesome. I definitely just stared at the walls, figuring out how to make my facility look like this place. This place rocks. 
the, it's invigorating. The walls are super. Um, it's just very cool. The atmosphere is cool. The people are nice. Uh, it's a pretty cool place to be. Very good learning atmosphere. I literally want to model it and steal everything that's here at this facility and uh, basically create it just on our business side. Once I saw what they were doing, I knew I had to get here at the conference. This is probably the best conference or seminar I've ever been to in over 30 years of business. You're not bored. You're awake, alive the whole time. It's not pushy. They don't try to sell you a bunch of things. I was looking to learn how to just get control of my life, my schedule, and just get a control of the business. Planning your time, breaking it all down, making time for the, you know, the F6 in your life, and just really implementing it and sticking with the program. It's really lively. He's, they're pretty friendly, uh, helpful, and very welcoming. I attended a conference a couple months back, and it was really the best business conference I've ever attended. At the workshop, I learned a lot about time management. Um, really prioritizing what's the most important. The biggest takeaways are, you know, you want to take a step-by-step -step approach to your business. So whether it's marketing, you know, what are those three marketing tools that you want to use to human resources. Now, some of the most successful people and successful businesses in this town, their owners were here today because they wanted to know more from Clay, and I found that to be kind of fascinating. The most valuable thing that I've learned is diligence. That businesses don't change overnight. It takes time effort and you got to go through the ups and downs of getting it to where you want to go. He actually gives you the road map out. I was stuck, didn't know what to do and he gave me the road map out step by step. We've set up systems in the business that make my life much easier, allow me some time freedom. Here you can ask any question you want, they guarantee it'll be answered. This conference like motivates me and also give me a lot of knowledge and tools. It's up to you to do this. Um, Everybody can do these things, they're, they're stuff that everybody knows, but if you don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for you. I can see the marketing working, and it, it's just an approach that makes sense. Probably the most notable thing is just the, the income increase that we've had. Everyone's super fun, it's super motivating. Uh, I've been here before, but I'm back again because it motivates me. Your competition's going to come eventually or try to pick up these tactics, so you better, you, if you don't, somebody else will. I'm Rachel with Tip Top Canine, and we just want to give a huge thank you to Clay and Vanessa Clark. Hey guys, I'm Ryan with Tip Top Canine. Just want to say a big thank you to Thrive 15. Thank you to Make Your Life Epic. We love you guys, we appreciate you, and really just appreciate how far you've taken us. This is our old house. Right? This is where we used to live a few years ago. This is our old neighborhood. So this is my old van and our old school marketing and this is our old team and by team I mean it's me and another guy. This is our new house with our new neighborhood. This is our new van with our new marketing and this is our new team. We went from 4 to 14 and I took this beautiful photo. We worked with several different business coaches in the past and they were all about helping Ryan sell better and um, just teaching sales, which is awesome, but Ryan is a really great salesman. So we didn't need that. We needed somebody to help us get everything that was in his head out into systems, into manuals and scripts and actually build a team. So now that we have systems in place, we've gone from one to 10 locations in only a year. In October 2016, we grew us 13 grand for the whole month. Uh, right now it's 2018, the month of October. It's only the 22nd. We've already grossed a little over 50 grand for the whole month, and we still have time to go. We're just thankful for you, thankful for Thrive and your mentorship, and we're really thankful that you guys have helped us to grow a business that we run now instead of the business running us. Just thank you, thank you, thank you times a thousand. So we really just want to thank you, Clay, and thank you, Vanessa, for everything you've done, everything you've helped us with. We love you guys. If you decide to not attend the Thrive Time Workshop, you're missing out on a great opportunity. The atmosphere of Clay's office is very lively. You can feel the energy as soon as you walk through the door. And it really got me and my team very excited.
If you decide not to come, you're missing out on an opportunity to grow your business, bottom line. Love the environment. I love the way that Clay presents and teaches. It's a way that not only allows me to comprehend what's going on, but he explains it in a way to where it just makes sense. The SEO optimization, branding, marketing. I've learned more in the last two days than I have the entire four years of college. The most valuable thing that I've learned, marketing is key, uh, marketing is everything. Making sure that you're branded accurately and clearly. How to grow a business using Google reviews and then just how to optimize our name through our website also. Helpful with uh, a lot of marketing, search engine optimization, um, uh, helping us really rank high in Google. The biggest thing I needed to learn was how to build my foundation, how to systemize everything and optimize everything, build my SEO. How to become more organized, uh, more efficient. How to make sure the business is really there to serve me, as opposed to me constantly being there for the business. New ways of advertising my business, as well as recruiting new employees. Group interviews, number one. Uh, before we felt like we were held hostage by our employees, group interviews has completely eliminated that because you're able to really find the people that would really be the best fit. Hands on how to hire people, how to deal with human resources, um, a lot about marketing, and overall just how to structure the business, how it works for me, and also then how that can translate into working better for my clients. The most valuable thing I've learned here is time management. I like the one hour of doing your business is real critical if I'm going to grow and change. Play really teaches you how to navigate through those things and not only find freedom, but find your purpose in your business and find the purposes for all those other people that directly affect your business as well. Everybody. 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 Everyone. Everyone needs to attend the conference because you get an opportunity to see that it's real.